On the 23rd of February 2007, at approximately 8.15pm, there was a serious accident on the West Coast Main Line. A Pendolino left the tracks after crossing a faulty set of points just south of Grey Rig in Cumbria. The accident investigation found the train had derailed after crossing points number 2B on the down main line controlled by the Lambrick ground frame. It also found that the scheduled inspection of these points due on the 18th of February 2007 had not been carried out meaning the fault had gone undetected. The 1730 service from London Euston to Glasgow Central, comprising Unit 390033, City of Glasgow, and nine carriages, was travelling at 95 miles per hour, or 153 kilometres an hour, and carried 105 passengers and a crew of four. The faulty points were located immediately after the Docker Viaduct, in fact so close that the front of the train would have derailed whilst the rear was still on the viaduct. Reports from passengers said the train suddenly began swaying and rocking violently before plunging down an embankment. The front carriage jackknifed with the majority of the train coming to rest in a field. It took almost four hours for the emergency services to fully evacuate the train with the use of thermal imaging being used to confirm everyone had been evacuated from the stricken carriages. Over 500 rescue personnel assisted in the rescue efforts, together with three Sea King helicopters, over 12 ambulances, six fire engines, three civilian mountain rescue teams, and the RAF Leeming Mountain Rescue Team, and a helicopter from Merseyside Police. This was not the simplest of rescue operations, with the weather, location and darkness all contributing to the difficulty. The pouring rain and remote location of the site created incredibly challenging conditions, with many ambulances and emergency vehicles becoming bogged in the muddy fields. Local four-wheel drives and tractors were used to tow them free. The derailment also caused significant damage to the overhead catenary cables and resulted in the whole circuit from Brock, which is near Preston, to T-Bay tripping. This caused all signalling in the area to fail safe to red and meant no electric services could run. Live television coverage the next morning clearly showed the extent of the damage and how the train had come to lie following the accident. The whole train had derailed, with carriages strewn in all sorts of positions in the field and on the embankment. The rear carriages were almost vertical on the sleepers and ballast. The most damage occurred in the front five carriages, where standard class was located, with the rear four carriages suffering less badly. The leading carriage, a driving motor coach, tumbled down the embankment, turning end for end. It came to rest on its side at the bottom of the embankment. The second carriage jackknifed against the first, causing the coupling to break. This carriage came to rest a little further along the track with one end in the air. The carriages in the Pendolino are built using a special welding technique called friction stir welding. This type of weld is extremely strong and helped keep the carriages structurally intact. All of the windows in the carriages remained in place without breaking, with the majority of damage being restricted to the crumple zones. The driver of the train had stayed within the cab, and specialised cutting equipment had to be employed to cut him free. It took over an hour to free the driver. The remainder of the crew were in the rear of the train. Greyrig Primary School was open to receive the survivors with local hospitals in the area on standby to receive more survivors. Passengers who were in a critical condition were admitted to Royal Preston Hospital. Sadly, one lady died in hospital from her injuries. She was 84-year-old Margaret Masson from Glasgow. Within three hours of the derailment, the site of the accident had been sealed off, with a five-mile cordon established around the area. The line was expected to be closed for two weeks with Virgin Trains saying that the line would not reopen to passenger services 
until the 12th of March 2007. The recovery operation was further slowed by problems in getting heavy lifting gear to the site, which required temporary roads to be constructed. Sir Richard Branson, Virgin Group Chairman, visited the site of the derailment at 11am the following morning to comment on the incident. During his news conference at the site, he said that he regarded the driver, named as Ian Black from Dumbarton, as a hero, as he had attempted to stop the train and remained in his seat to ensure the safety of the passengers. Black left hospital in late March and stated, I've got to be in the cab to help the train, and it never crossed my mind to leave. Branson also thanked local residents for their help at the accident site, describing how he was very impressed to hear how those kind people rallied round, opening their hearts and opening their doors to strangers in distress. Local farmers assisted the emergency services by transporting equipment using quad bikes and four-wheel drive vehicles. Sergeant Joe Fawcett of the Cumbria Constabulary also offered thanks, saying that there are so many people who have given up their own time to contribute in some way to dealing with the aftermath of the derailment that it would be unfair to name them individually for fear of missing someone out. Branson also paid tribute to the Pendolino train, comparing it to a tank. He also added, if the train had been old stock, then the number of injuries and the mortalities would have been horrendous. Several sources also gave their praise due to the fact that the carriages generally stayed intact during the accident. As a result of the suspicion that faulty points were the cause of the grey rig derailment, Network Rail checked over 700 sets of similar points across the country as a precautionary measure, saying later that nothing of concern had been found. The operation to remove the train from the site began on the evening of the 1st of March 2007, with the first carriages moved from the embankment. This allowed passengers' property to be retrieved and gave investigators access to the train interior, which previously had not been possible because it would have been unsafe. The last of the carriages were removed on the 4th of March 2007, and the A685 road was reopened. The points which caused the derailment, the points 2A on the opposite line, were removed from the track following the derailment, and the line is now welded continuously for 2.2 miles, 3.5 kilometres, including the line over the Docker viaduct. The derailment also brought down the overhead line equipment, which had to be replaced. Modern double-line catenary from a single stand was used for this. This reduces the risk of carriages bending if a derailment occurs, for example becoming wedged between the overhead line stanchions, as seen in the Southall crash. Lambrick ground frame, 660 yards, 600 metres, southwest of the accident site, controls two crossovers, each one comprising two sets of points allowing trains to cross from one running line to the other in emergencies or during track maintenance work. These points are used only occasionally, operated locally after release is obtained from Carlisle Power Signal Box. They are normally locked in the mainline running position. Early statements by Chief Superintendent Martin Ripley of British Transport Police suggested that investigations would focus on these points. On the 26th of February, an interim report published by the Rail Accident Investigation Branch, RAIB, outlined the current progress of the investigation. The report contained a single conclusion, that the immediate cause of the accident was the condition of the stretcher bar arrangement at point 2B at Lambrig crossover, which resulted in the loss of gauge separation of the point switch blades. The stretcher bars, components that hold the moving blades of the points the correct distance apart, had been found to be disconnected or missing. Of the three bars, one was not in position, another had nuts and bolts missing, and two were fractured. The points in question were facing the direction of travel of the train. The RAIB report noted that the network rail new measurement train 
ran over the site on the 21st of February. This train uses lasers and other instruments to make measurements of the track geometry and other features such as overhead line height and stagger, and the track gauge, twist and count. It is not used to inspect points, but it does make a video record of the track which can be reviewed later. Responding to the suggestion that the train's video might have been used to detect points damage and thereby prevent the accident, a network rail spokesman said, The inspection train runs at speeds of up to 125 miles per hour, or, on this particular stretch, 95 miles per hour. There would be no point somebody watching it at that speed, as they wouldn't be able to pick up any faults. It has to be run in super slow motion to spot faults. The train runs for up to 18 hours a day, 7 days a week. It would probably take someone most of the month to watch a day's worth of data. It's not what it's there for. It's a backwards reference tool. Network Rail admitted it failed to carry out scheduled visual track inspection in the area on the Sunday before the derailment. The line closure that followed the initial service suspension saw most of Virgin services terminate at Preston or Lancaster from the south, with buses to Carlisle and all stations along the route. The only exception was an early morning and late evening through service from Carlisle to London and return. This was diesel hauled via Blackburn and Settle. There were also several non-stop trains from Preston to London Euston. Local services all terminated short, but many were able to make their journeys as their destinations were off branches. The Caledonia Sleeper was diverted via the East Coast Main Line along with freight services, although some were diesel hauled via Blackburn and Settle. Trains began running on the line once more on the 12th of March, subject to a speed restriction of 80 kilometres an hour, 50 miles an hour, at the crash site. The first train was the 0510 Manchester Glasgow service. On the 13th of January 2012, the Office of Rail Regulation announced that Network Rail were to be prosecuted under Section 3-1 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 for the company's failure to provide and implement suitable and sufficient standards, procedures, guidance, training, tools and resources for the inspection and maintenance of fixed stretcher bar points. At the first hearing in Lancaster Magistrates Court on the 28th of February 2012, Network Rail indicated an intention to plead guilty to the charges. On the 4th of April 2012, Network Rail were fined a total of £4,118,037, including costs, following the court case. Critical commentary appeared in the media concerning the knighthood awarded to John Armit in the 2012 New Year's Honours List for services to engineering and construction. Armit had been the chief executive of Network Rail at the time of the Grey Rig derailment, and the family of victims of the accident criticised the award, which, coincidentally, was conferred on the same day that Network Rail were prosecuted for the accident. After a two-week hearing, one of the issues Coroner Ian Smith announced was that he would be issuing a Rule 43 report. The intention of the report is to raise concerns with authorities to prevent similar incidents occurring again. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, share and subscribe for many more videos.